Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello, I'm Beth Courtney. Welcome to Louisiana Public Square. We're delighted to be coming to you from the Louisiana Immersive Technologies Enterprise in the city of Lafayette. This center is commonly known as LIGHT, and it indeed has been a bright spot as an economic driver for the area. Good evening. I'm Craig Freeman. Both LIGHT and Lafayette have been using the power of tonight's topic, technology, to move the region forward. From digital media editing to citywide fiber access, Lafayette displays technology's potential for the state. Well, as Louisiana attempts to move its economy toward higher growth, high-tech industries, how prepared is it to meet the challenge? Let's explore where the state is succeeding and where there is room for improvement. Is Louisiana poised to become the technology capital of the South? To some, that may seem a bit far-fetched, but not to Mark Lewis. What people don't know about is that over the last, actually between 2002 and 2007, Louisiana was one of the top five, actually top 10 growing states from technology workforce, and they were seventh in terms of percentage growth in technology workers. Lewis is president of the Louisiana Technology Council, a nonprofit organization that promotes and supports the development of the technology industry throughout the state. I think over the next several years, you're going to see the advent of a a really big a boost in economic development from the digital gaming industry. That growth is already happening. Elliot Adams is with the Louisiana Department of Economic Development. Turbo Squid, based out of New Orleans, is the largest seller of 3D models in the world. And they were the, actually one of the first companies to apply for the tax credit back in 2005. And they continue to have a thriving business here in the state. Uh, there's companies also, uh, like Energized Entertainment, uh, which has released a uh, title for the Xbox, and they're based in Baton Rouge. There's Nifty Entertainment, which is up in North Louisiana, doing very, very innovative video streaming technology. Philip Holt is vice president of gaming giant Electronic Arts, one of the leading video gaming companies in the world. Some of their most popular games are tested at the Electronic Arts Baton Rouge facility, located on the campus of LSU. This is the first time the company has tested games outside of its home base in Florida. I admire Louisiana's interest in the digital media industry broadly, and I think it's done, it's been smart in its pursuit of creating an environment that is attractive for companies like ours um, to be here. And I think uh, as, as more companies look at what we're doing in Baton Rouge, uh, from our industry. I think they're, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you see other companies that follow suit. And why wouldn't they? Tax right. credits have made Otherwise, Louisiana very attractive to the high-tech industry. There's the digital media tax credit and the research and development tax credit for firms with 50 employees or less. Traditionally, the oil, gas, and petrochemical companies have provided the bulk of the high-paying jobs in Louisiana. But with that workforce drastically shrinking, many believe that technology will provide the next big economic boom for the state. Mark Lewis. Um, technology typically brings higher paid jobs. Uh, it brings uh, a younger workforce. And I think um, with the growth of the technology industry in Louisiana, I think we can bring those uh, young entrepreneurs uh, to this region and to the state to help with the economic development of the region. There's Still, Elliot Adams says program. the state faces a major hurdle. And there's, it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. If you have great university programs that are graduating people in this profession, but they don't have the jobs in the state, then certainly those people are going to need to look elsewhere. But the Louisiana Immersive Technologies Enterprise, also known as LIGHT, is helping to grow more in-state technology companies. We're selling innovation. It's a way to utilize technology in a different way. And they're having success. Light CEO Henry Florsham says their relationship with Disney attracted Pixel Magic, a California visual effects firm, to open its second site in Lafayette. 
And so now they're hiring people in Lafayette and they're making that investment in Louisiana as opposed to spending all that money back in California. But incentives aren't enough to drive and maintain success. A qualified workforce is also a must, and that's where the state is falling short. Louisiana ranks 47th in workforce education and 41st in number of scientists and engineers as a percentage of the workforce, according to the 2008 State New Economy Index. The Karen Crow High School Academy of Information Technology is working to buck that trend. Kit Becknell is director of the academy. Our academy prepares our students with those Century 21st skills, technical skills, and of course um, the community engages actively in mentoring, job shadowing, and actually employing during their internship in better preparing our students for the workforce. So we have created that pipeline from high school, post-secondary education, to the workforce. Michael Abair is a senior in the program. It, it just it makes any student capable of being able to work in almost any technology job there is. There are four other high school IT programs like this one across the state. Educational pipelines like these that prepare high school students for college and ultimately the high-tech workforce are bearing results. Elliot Adams. We have great people here in Louisiana that can do all those things. They can do computer programming, they can do digital art, they, they know gaming, they know the web. Um, and what we hope is that they can, we can build a infrastructure where they can launch their careers in the state or even come back. Helping to reverse Louisiana's high-tech brain drain is the Lafayette Utilities System. LUS offers high-speed fiber optic access for city residents and businesses. They told us we wouldn't have the technical expertise to operate the system and we brought in a number of university graduates who had moved out of state back over here to be able to do that. Competitors fought the development of the LUS fiber project, but Director of Utilities Terry Huval says it is working better than expected. So now what we're bringing to the community is choice and low prices, but the biggest thing we're bringing is, is a promise for the future. It puts Lafayette on a map of a major transmission and distribution of broadband and internet connectivity that we think is going to open up great opportunity for economic development. Like Lafayette, the rest of the state has the potential to further its high-tech economic goals through its expertise and research programs. But whether Louisiana can successfully build on its existing strengths remains to be seen. Joining me to discuss those strengths are our audience members. They include Lafayette area residents who are randomly recruited and surveyed for us by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. We also have a member of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council and joining us via high-speed video conferencing, Kit Becknell, Director of the Academy of Information Technology at Karen Crow High and some of her students. Now let's look at some of our sur survey results. Of those who responded to our pre-show survey, a total of 84% agree or strongly agree that new high technology industries are necessary for the state's healthy economic future. Only 4% disagree. 12% neither agreed nor disagree. A total of 84% of respondents also agree or strongly agree that Louisiana should develop tax incentives to attract high tech companies to the state. 11% oppose this approach. 5% were neutral on the issue. An overwhelming majority of those surveyed 82% support state government spending to encourage research and development of new technologies. 11% oppose this approach, while 7% were uncertain. So let's start there. Do you support Louisiana spending more money to develop new technologies? And if so, what areas should we pursue? Blake, you, you agree we should spend more money for high technology? Oh, definitely. And I think the base is in, is in, is in ed education. How are we going to expect these corporations and these companies that are high tech industries to come to Louisiana if we're not investing in our education? If we're expecting my generation to stay here, get educated here, and help develop a new skilled workforce here in Louisiana, then the generation that's in charge now in Baton Rouge needs to invest more in our education system so that we have the tools necessary to have this kind of vibrant new industry in Louisiana. So it's education? Should we also spend money to develop technologies today? Gordon? I think we should. Uh, we have all the obligations to develop the technology. We have all the capability to do it too. Uh, our universities are prime for that and situated regionally so that they can add to their region but also to the state. 
you know, that's all you know out of your head too? Yes, especially in the schools. Okay. Uh, starting at pre-K. We need more technology yes, every day for our kids. Almost definitely. But now, what is technology? I mean, is, is it green technology? Is it solar panels? Is it high-speed internet? We can talk about it broadly, but what's, what should our priority be? John? Uh, for my money, our priority ought to be on high-speed internet type things uh, and building out infrastructure, which is something that we don't often talk about. We talk about education. We talk about uh, trying to attract new business through various incentive plans or outright subsidy. What we don't talk about is the things that we could do as a community. And one of those things is to build our own infrastructure and have that as provided so that when people come, they already have something to use. So when, you, when you say infrastructure, do you mean roads and highways, or do you mean an inter, a, a, high, a technology uh, infrastructure? The equivalent of roads and highways, okay. railroads. Uh, High-speed fiber optics, uh, wireless backbone, uh, places like light that have a lot of computational ability. All these things could be turned into public assets that could be used by almost any company. Dave, you, are, you agree? Indeed. Um, broadband to me is where everything is heading. And I'm in somewhat of a unique situation in that I manage the public radio station here in Lafayette. Our objective with terrestrial radio is to start figuring out what relevant platforms to be delivering our programming on. And we know that uh, young people are using all sorts of platforms. We've got podcasting, we've got on-demand programming, we've got uh, cell phones that have now turned into the item, you know, that, that carries it all. And so uh, our mission is to really uh, listen to the younger people and see how they are using our product and make sure that we're there. And really to do that, we need people, radio stations have come from analog, reel-to-reel -reel machines to looking like computer workstations now. And so uh, it's very important for us to have somebody who's savvy in terms of uh, networking and uh, also uh, high-speed internet and servicing our website and those sorts of things. Well, who pays for this? Uh, should the state pay for this? Should private industry pay for this? H how do we get the, the infrastructure that we're looking for? Matthew? I think you have to get the companies involved. Um, I think uh, we need to figure out some way in order for them to contribute. Um, get them involved at high school level. You know, maybe they can start programs to teach these children. Um, I think that's the that's the answer. Khadija. Well, I believe that there's still a, a digital divide between the haves and the have do not. And just recently, uh, the uh, taxpayers, the, the council passed a bond for a L LUS for a $125 million that the taxpayers will have to pay for that. And still, with the uh, accessibility to fiber, you still have those that, that do have it and those that don't have it. So to me, there's a serious digital divide in technology uh, in our communities. How can we solve it? Is there anything that we can do to, to bridge that gap? It, it, it seems odd that w the state should pay for something that only some people can use. John? Uh, well, we're starting it in Lafayette. I do think that building out the LUS fiber system is a real strong step in that direction. Here in Lafayette, we can offer some of the world's fastest communication networks for that in a way that undercuts by at least 20% the incumbents. What we know from studies of the digital divide is that almost the, probably the primary thing is price. People can't yet afford it. If we can lower that price, and that's part of what public ownership does, is lowers that price. And that's what we're doing here in Lafayette. I don't see why other people in the state can't do that as well. So we can have a public-private partnership that, that kind of works, Rob? Well, it, it, it's 50-50, but uh, tax incentives keep coming to my mind because uh, Hollywood's not having a good time right now, like the whole national economy. But there's a lot of filming going on in this area and others around the state because of tax incentives. So you give a business a reason to move here, say, give them a tax break to train their own increase the workforce, increase the jobs. And again, you know, the starting in high school, like in Karen Crow, that's a wonderful start too. All comes together. Well, let's go to Karen Crow. Kit, uh, do you have a question or a, a part of, of this? Is there something that we can do to make sure that we're getting this technology in schools? From my personal perspective and high school experience, I have witnessed that IT used as a tool embedded in core subjects, better equips our workforce, 
and prepares our students for high school, uh, excuse me, for higher education. So we have, we have this need in high school, but are we training a workforce that can actually help us develop this technology and then use this technology once we have it? We, sure. We definitely need to um, get our education up to par and teach these new technologies so we'd have better jobs here. Well, then, but Blake, earlier you, you talked about education, and Kit, you talked about education at the, uh, at the secondary level, but it seems like we're in a tough budget year. Um, it seems like we may have to cut uh, some higher ed. It seems like we may have to cut some programs in high schools. How do we balance this need to, uh, you know, for high technology with the, the budget woes that we have? Melissa? Um, I think that they should remain in a budget but I also believe that they shouldn't overspend because um, it's, we're encouraged as citizens you know, to remain in a budget and you know, handle our finances properly. So I think that wherever the funding is coming from for the technology, that the funding should also remain in the budget. And I mean, I'm all for the technology, but I also want to say that don't forget about the other fields. I mean, um, there's um, such as um, med the medical field and don't forget about education. I mean, they want to jump the gun to to um, encourage technology, but you also need to start addressing the, the bottom and the bottom problems such as education. You need to educate people in order to have those jobs in technology. Start from the bottom. Start from the bottom. Start educating our babies from the bottom so that they'll grow that technology in their mind okay. and they can go forward. John? I don't think we need to stay so focused on technology per se. As you said earlier, are we training a workforce to use the technology. I think what we need to be doing is training a workforce that requires the technology. And I think that can begin in education, that can be in the higher education and lower levels, where you're actually giving people the kinds of problems that technology can solve. I think we get too focused on the technology itself. Let's focus on the problems we can solve. And I think if we give people those kinds of complex problems that require technology, they'll do all kinds of things. I feel very lucky to live in Lafayette where we're developing this kind of rich infrastructure and rich possibilities, where students can begin to play with this kind of thing. But I think really we've got to be thinking about what's the step beyond that. We see digital media now, but there's more stuff coming. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, we, we uh, well, are our priorities right? I mean, should we be focusing on digital media? Should we be focusing on the entertainment industry? Are we luring the best industries for Louisiana? Um, or are we paying outsiders to come in and take money and then go back? Maggie? Um, a good question. I happen to come from healthcare or work in healthcare and have some familiarity with it. So um, clearly, I, I feel that that's a pretty important industry for the state as well. Um, and I agree with John's comments about really um, focusing on using technology to help with problem solving. Um, and if I may go back to a question you asked earlier about how to bridge funding um, with the need and with this tremendous growing interest in technology and using it for problem solving. I think that's really an environment that's ripe for a lot of public-private co uh, collaboratives. And I think really from, um, a, there's a lot of opportunity for creative problem solving and just within this whole environment that can then um, move us forward in terms of use and implementation and adoption of technology. Good deal, and Blake, you also. Yeah, I definitely agree with what everyone said so far. However, everything goes back to education. The medical field, it, you know, it's moving towards more advances in technology. In today's world, almost everybody uses technology in their everyday life. iPods, the radio, Facebook, MySpace, everything, especially my generation. And we need to go back to education. If we're not educating our workforce here in Louisiana, if we're not educate, educating my generation, if we're not raising teacher pay, which is almost $10,000 below the national average, then how are we going to expect these sorts of industries, the medical field, or any sort of industry that's based off of technology, especially since we're moving in that direction? We can't. We need to go back to education. We need to invest there. We can't afford to cut spending for education in Louisiana. And that's definitely one area we don't need to cut. We need to invest more there, and then everything else will, will sort of fall into place. So we, we shouldn't focus on technology? We should focus more on education? No, we should focus on technology. We need to put technology in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And with a skilled workforce, technology will come here. When our students are able to, when our students are more familiar with technology and how to do you know, simple tasks such as PowerPoint, yeah. Microsoft, things like that, which I don't think people are um, familiar with as they should be here in Louisiana, then industries will come here, but it all goes back to education. John? Uh, I was just going to say the education should be the basic education to allow a student to access technology. 
If you can't do your ABCs, you can't read and write, you can't learn how to run a computer or how to build one. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it has to go back to the basics, and I think that's where we're getting too far advanced in our uh, pre-Ks and Ks and all that is that we're teaching them technology rather than teaching them how or giving them the skills to access the technology. Okay. Well, my comment would be, you know, not being directly involved in probably some of the fields that you people are. I'm, I'm retired now, but uh, I know one thing. To, to move this program forward, you're going to have to have support. And to do that, you're going to have to reach people that are not aware of what you guys are doing. Because I, I love to read anything I can get a hold of about what's being done at, at UL, LSU. Uh, yet, I just read a brochure and I found out a whole lot of things I didn't know. So to me, the first step is let's, let's get everybody knowing what you guys are doing. And, and, and the question that I was going to ask when you all did the cards was, you know, how are we going to connect all of this thing to make it work most effectively? And, and you know, because there's going to be shortages of money. There, there's definitely going to be short because of what's going on right now. So we have to make the money that we have, and, and it's got to be spent effectively to where it's going to get the best end result. And that would be my comment. Well, we hope we have some answers for that. And so when we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss technology in Louisiana. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. We're discussing technology in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Kurt Isink is the executive director for the Louisiana Workforce Commission. He was appointed to the position in July by Governor Jindal. Mr. Isink most recently served as chief of staff and press secretary for the commission developing and implementing initiatives to improve workforce development. Jacqueline Beauchamp is the co-founder and CEO of Energized Entertainment an interactive digital media development and publishing company headquartered in Baton Rouge. Before founding Energized, Ms. Beauchamp was the first African-American female general manager within Motorola, where she led the multimedia systems division. Anthony Greco is a professor in, the, in economics in the College of Business at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Dr. Greco's research focuses on government regulation and antitrust economics, and he has served as a consultant for various economic initiatives in the Lafayette area. Jim Clinton is CEO for the Senla Advantage Partnership, an Alexandria-based nonprofit dedicated to creating more and better economic opportunities in central Louisiana. Mr. Clinton recently returned to Louisiana from serving as executive director of the Southern Growth Policies Board, a 13-state alliance based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Let's go to our participants for their questions. And when we ended, Ronald, you wanted to know about how we would pay for things. Do you have a question for our guests? Uh, they gave me 10 minutes during the break to figure out how we can finance this, all this technology that everybody wants to get done. But uh, basically what I, what I said was that I thought that the only way to get things moving in a project of this magnitude is to get support, full support from the entire community, people that are not even aware of what you guys are doing in all of the different areas that you're doing it in. And I think all of it's great, but uh, I know that it, it, you may think that people know what you're doing, but you know I, I'm very interested in in all of the aspects uh, I've, I've read about what LSU's doing, UL's doing, and I think the first step is to just get people more aware. It may take you know a few more of these type programs and things of that nature to get it done, but I believe that would be very helpful to get things motivated. And is there anything that we can do to get people to understand what we're trying to do in the state, Jim? Well, I, I certainly agree with the awareness uh, d discussion. That, that's critically important. Uh, I agree with the education discussion. Uh, we can't do this un unless we're willing to make a commitment to um, building our knowledge levels uh, across the board. Um, you know, we didn't get into this mess uh, overnight, and I don't think we're going to solve it in the upcoming legislative session. I, I don't think we will fix everything in, in one session. Uh, I know that we could spend the rest of the time talking about how we're going to balance the budget this time. Um, I think it's a more productive conversation for us to talk about how we're going to ba balance the budget over a 10-year period, how we're going to uh, set some real priorities and live with those priorities, how we're going to make education as important as we say it is, uh, fund it accordingly, and manage it accordingly. And Professor, is there a way that we can kind of make that balance or do that balance and still have the technology that people want? I think so. Of course, as a part of the educational process, as one of the uh, audience participants was saying, is uh, teach technology at all levels. Uh, there's, that, there's not a disconnect between education and technology. It should be a basic part of technology, uh, education all the way up. 
and Jackie, once once we we have the skills, how do we make sure that we can get more people to to, to know about the projects we're doing here in the state? Well, I, I think the, the the skills are here. Um, the the experience in taking it from our base where it is today to where we're going to focus from a state perspective. Um, I think it is very, very critical for us to have focused strategies. I'm a business person, so everything that we do in our business is to focus on the core aspect of our business. I think when we begin focusing on the core aspects of where we're wanting to look to take our state, we need to put those steps in place to make those things happen. And Kurt, I think you're the, one of the ones that is making that happen. What do we do? Well, there's a number of things that have to happen. Uh, right now, there's, there's obviously a big debate going on in Louisiana about how to fund higher education, uh, post-secondary education at all levels. What's critical there is, uh, from my perspective, uh, dealing with workforce issues, and I think that that's critical to most of the state, is that there is strong alignment between what we're producing from our post-secondary education and what the needs of business and industry are. If we can provide the lack of a, a, an appropriately trained workforce is the greatest impediment to business expansions and business relocations to the state and development of a bigger economy which we need for everybody to do better and to create more opportunities so if we can meet the demand that's out there today and there is demand in high-tech fields uh, if we can meet that demand we, we allow those companies to grow uh, companies like Jackie's we allow other companies to come in also uh, because if we're producing workers they're going to come in and compete with our homegrown industries for those people and they do that best by starting a starting up shop here in Louisiana one, one point I want to make is that there are many more high-tech jobs out there than jobs just in high-tech industries you know you know uh, digital media it's obviously a high-tech industry that's a real priority for the state to grow that um, we have the best tax credits for that industry in the country right now. So the state is doing a lot to grow these high-tech industries. But there are high-tech employees in every industry, and we need to produce a workforce that's able to fill all of those jobs. It's a much bigger issue. If you look at health care, I think you work in health care. Mm -hmm. So much of health care is high-tech. A lot of it is just very person-to-person -person oriented, but all of the tools, the diagnostics, the treatments and so forth, development of drugs, uh, scanning, uh, so it's very high tech. There's tons of high tech jobs in healthcare, and that is one of our driver industries in Louisiana. There are tons of high tech jobs in the oil patch, in uh, you name it. Everybody's got an IT help desk. Those are high tech folks. They don't all have four year degrees, but they're high tech by any, by any measure. So we have to do a, a great job in Louisiana of retooling the way we produce a workforce to aim people at those jobs. That's what's going to allow us to grow. And, and John, I thought you had a, a question kind of related to the kind of the way to, to move the state forward. Yeah, I guess one of the things that I've always been really interested in is simply providing the appropriate infrastructure. It's all well and good to provide education. I'm a former educator and I believe in it. Trust me. Uh, and it's all well and good to essentially subsidize industry. But what about what we've done in the past in almost all of your industry you can name is actually build the infrastructure, build the roads, provide in income to build the railroads. What can the state do, the state and local governments for that matter, to actually provide the, both the infrastructure, both the broadband communications and the sort of uh, computational power that anyone could use and put that on the network? What can we do in this state to sort of leap over the idea that private industry has to provide everything in little bitty pockets everywhere? I, I think that uh, to some extent, of course, in, in Lafayette, that's already happening. You're, yes. you're doing it here, and that's a pretty good model. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the price of you doing it is that no one else gets to do it. Um, the, there was legislation passed immediately in your wake that prevented any other city from doing what you did. Uh, so there are battles. First thing to fix. Yeah, there are battles to be fought. I, I guess is is all I'm saying about that. Uh, there, there's some good news out there. Um, uh, like it or not, the stimulus plan uh, is putting a lot of dollars into uh, infrastructure, and a good bit of that uh, is in uh, high tech infrastructure. It's specifically in broadband. Louisiana will have some of those dollars. Some of the first wave of decisions uh, is being made right now. There are I've seen a number of the proposals. Some of them are pretty good. Um, uh, so you're, you're going to see some investment moving in that direction. Uh, but if we really want to do what you're proposing, then we have to have a state conversation on the role of government and the role of private business. And, and this runs classically into uh, are you for government or are you, are you for business and are you willing to figure out what your, what your 
can do in both cases. Well, just to extend here. that, for the folks down here who are actually in business, mm -hmm. is it a matter of being for government or being for business? Or is there a role that government can play in facilitating your business, same way that the transportation industry uses our, our roads every day that we pay for to run their business? No, it, it, it definitely, well, I view it as a, it's a partnership. Uh, there is a role that government has and there's a role that the private sector has. The, the key thing is when those, those two things are aligned, there's a lot that can be done. And I think what Kirk is really speaking to as it pertains to the workforce, if there is not an alignment on, on businesses, you know, take digital media for instance, if there's not an alignment for our educational system to be aligned to providing a skilled workforce right. for digital media, then having companies here is going to be very difficult and very challenging. So what we have to do is to have both the private sector and the public sector sitting down at the table, understanding where the needs are, making sure that the appropriate workforce, all the items are put in place uh, from an educational standpoint, and then that's when businesses can continue to grow, can continue to move products forward, infrastructure can, can expand from there. But for me, the key aspect of the business growing is that skilled workforce. It is so critical. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I was going to say that certainly there has to be a partnership between government and business. Government doesn't exist in as an entity unto itself or not as business. And uh, to business to be conducted in a, in a non-chaotic, orderly, uh, efficient sort of way, you have to have uh, uh, physical infrastructure, educational infrastructure, and so on. So, and as, as actually at the state level, that should be the state's first function to provide the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that we, and the infrastructure in the physical sense, as well as do other things to create the general uh, economic and social uh, environment so that people can conduct business in an orderly fashion and a, in a safe fashion. We have a system of laws that have to be enforced, a system of courts to put those, uh, enforcement of contracts, uh, uh, the, the physical infrastructure. All those things have to come together. And uh, to uh, uh, follow up on Mr. Clinton's point, uh, there are going to be some funds available uh, in the stimulus package. The point is you have to be a little patient with that. That's going to take some time. That's not an immediate impact. And uh, so that's going to take some time. But we have to per persevere, keep our goals, set our goals, and, and keep the, our view at the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And we're making progress. And uh, I don't know if it's been said uh, tonight, but uh, uh, perhaps maybe in private conversations, but publicly, we are the third uh, leading state in the country with the, the film industry and so on. And I mean, we may be so, so far back, uh, still far back away from New York and California, but being number three is pretty good when you consider we only put those tax incentives into effect in 2002. It shows you can make some rapid progress. It gives you some hope. And, uh, you know. You know. Uh, you're, you're right, and I think government has a significant role to play in growing business and providing opportunities. And I think that, you know, uh, skill workforce the, with the appropriate skills, whatever those skill levels are, is important. But so is just a general business climate mm -hmm. uh, that's conducive to growth and, and, to, and to risk taking and, and investment mm -hmm. and research and so forth. And I think our state has made some great strides uh, in, in, th in those areas too. Um, onerous business taxes have been reduced. We have, you know, um, uh, digital media, the, some of the really the, the best tax credits in the country right now. Uh, there's a new program I think mentioned uh, earlier in the show um, to encourage R&D by small businesses. These are the kinds of things that government can do that encourages growth and investment and risk taking and the kinds of innovation that's going to allow us to grow and to become more prosperous. And I think that, that Louisiana has really been stepping up. If you look at our ranking in, in throughout this, uh, the way we've weathered this recession for a lot of reasons, um, but second best of any state in the country. I think North Dakota is the only state that's weathered it better than we have so far. Now, it's taken, you know, the, the silver lining in the recession is that it now positions us a little bit better than our com competitive states to, to, to move forward. And we have to take advantage of that. And I think we have some pieces in place now as a state that will enable us to do that perhaps a little bit better than we could have before. John? Well, I wanted to know more about those pieces because I think I'm really curious to know um, about how we can incubate those public-private partnerships. Like, I understand that we have to target today's industries, the digital media industries, but I'm also thinking about industries for tomorrow. Sure. I mean, I live in Lafayette, Louisiana. Where have we really innovated? We innovated tremendously in light manufacturing and in culture, really in humanities. And so 
how can we, we bring those pieces together to, to create pockets of, of enterprise and innovation to, to look toward the, the, what's beyond the digital well, media that, frontier? There's an initiative underway, it's just begun. It's the Louisiana Innovations Council, uh, which is uh, associated with Louisiana Economic Development. And its job is to really come up and, de with and develop a blue ocean strategy for the state that looks at where the opportunities are going to be you know, a couple years down the road, five years down the road, 15 years down the road. And, and weigh the likelihood of growth in those industries, uh, the competitive edge that we might have if we get involved in those industries now versus other states, and, and how well those industries are likely to do versus what we have in the state today. So that when we look at workforce development and, and creating a business climate that's conducive to growth, that it's actually appropriate for those industries where we wanna, that we want to actually develop in the state. That, that's begun, it's a fairly new effort, and, and we should have some, uh, a plan coming out there fairly soon. Yeah, because I, I, I work at, at UL Lafayette, and, and we are the only <laughs> university in Louisiana, in fact, the only university in the Deep South, to be invited to be part of Project Bamboo, which is a Mellon Foundation initiative to build an international cyber infrastructure for the humanities. And one of the reasons they came to us is because of our history of innovating in that domain. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are real possibilities there, but I want to, be able to take what we're doing at the university at the research level and begin to build that out into industrial applications. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, Oracle has come to us and said, look, we like the way you're thinking about things. What, what can we sort of work on here? Uh, are there people thinking about that at the state level, of how we can, we can begin to build on those little tiny seeds and begin to actually grow some plants out of that? Yeah, there are incubators associated with, uh, if not all, certainly most of the, the, the universities that we have in the state, and certainly we've we got to encourage that. Mm -hmm. I think we have tremendous... Um, uh, capacity in Louisiana to be innovative and to develop things. We have a history of that. We haven't done a good job of taking those things to market uh, historically. Mm -hmm. um, but I think shows like this, people like you, um, the folks who've said that we really need to, need to do a better job like yourself of, of, of telling people what's going on, what these things are. Oracle shouldn't have to try to figure out what's happening. We ought to be screaming at Oracle. Look what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and and when we are innovative, then I think you see Oracle's looking to partner with you. Um, that's the kind of uh, synergy that, that, that happens when everybody gets aligned and, 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 and government, uh, education, business and industry, industry start looking at the same targets. Yeah. Let's get a, a, a question from our next generation. Uh, I think Aaron over at the Academy has a question for us. Yes. What does broadband mean for education to you? And, and maybe Jim or Anthony, is, what does, how does broadband help us move forward with this? I think it depends on, on a specific application. It's also a, a geographical question in, in large measure. Um, it, it has a direct, uh, direct implications for rural areas. Uh, we always talk about how we want to be able to deliver education where people are. We don't want people to have to travel uh, 80 miles to, uh, to learn from a specific teacher. We want to be able to do that uh, through broadband. Um, most of our rural areas don't have that capacity and many of our rural citizens don't have the knowledge that they would need to access it. So the opportunity is very specific. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we provide the education and the resources so that it actually filters into our rural areas. And, and Khadija, I know you had a question really kind of dealing with, you know, not necessarily rural, but kind of the digital divide and how do we bridge some of these gaps? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, there's definitely a digital divide in a lot of the communities, uh, specifically with you trying to get high tech uh, fiber when you don't even you don't even have internet. And in order to get the fiber, you have to have the internet. A lot of the, the some of the schools don't even have uh, accessibility to computers. That type of divide, we've got to be able to address that, uh, particularly in in our communities. And I think we are, but it's going to take some time. Uh, and again, it can't be done overnight. Uh, but I think we, we want to quicken the pace of it. But I think we, we're moving in that direction. I think certainly uh, locally and uh, in this, the state. And but it does take some time. It can't be done uh, in an overnight situation, unfortunately. There are some models out there. Nor North Carolina specifically <laughs> has done uh, a brilliant job of of be beginning to bridge those divides, both geographically, culturally. Uh, as, as you know, there, there are issues in inner cities, there are issues in rural areas, uh, and, and in many cases they're the same issues. Uh, North Carolina has spent money both on infrastructure and on education. They, they have uh, centers set up in pretty much every rural community 
uh, that provide both access and knowledge of, of how you use those computers and how you use the internet. Uh, those are crucial, crucial pieces of this puzzle. And Edith, I thought you had a question about uh, energy. Innovators. Yes. What are they? I need to know more information about it. I read in the information forums about incubators and I, I don't know anything about it. Please let me know what it is. Sure. I'll, I'll, if I, if I could, Absolutely. I'll, I'll speak to it from a, from a, from a, pr a former incubator yes. uh, tenant myself. Essentially what an incubator is for a, a new company, a startup company, is to provide you with an infrastructure and, and not just physical infrastructure, but infrastructure with resources around you to help you formulate your business, not necessarily your business plan, but help you really, really hone in where you can be successful going into your business. For me, um, in, in going into uh, the, the video game industry, let's, let's use that one as just one example. Um, it was really focusing on where my business was, but what was it really, really going to take for me to be successful going into that industry? And what you end up having around you is getting a team of, of, of advisors that can help you to prevent you from making certain mishaps or mistakes along the way, uh, provide you with certain guidance. Because at the end of the day, it's about you being successful. Yeah, the, the physical infrastructure, that's great. That helps you lower your costs. But really, the, the, the benefit and the key benefit that an incubator has to provide to you is the ability to help you uh, carve out your niche of where you're going to win and be successful in a particular industry. And then you got to go and do the hard work by making it all happen. So it's just for businesses or is it just for, I mean, is it schools as well? Or? I, I haven't seen it where it has been for, for, for schools, but, just for businesses. But, I've, but I've seen it where it has been for, okay. for businesses. Right. Thank you. Sure. No and professor, do they work? I mean, you know, we, we've got some success stories. Oh, for sure, sitting sure. right by. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Story. But present company. Right. And saying. some work better than others, but it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a comfort uh, to know that you've got some advice and uh, some expertise to help you avoid some missteps along the way and guide you in the right direction. So it helps you to be, uh, from the get-go, a more efficient operator. Don't forget out there to make those mistakes on your own. You've got some backup and uh, steering you in the right direction. Okay. You how do you get in touch with these people? What, how do you access it? Yeah. I've oh. never heard of well, it. Well, for, for, for me, what, what I did was, was sought out where um, the technology or the, the technical incubators were and where businesses were, were sort of, you know, for instance, in, in Baton Rouge, it was the um, Louisiana Technology Park. And in, 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 in Lafayette, there is an incubator that exists here as well. So it's a matter of identifying and knowing where those incubators exist within your own city. Uh, and they do. They do exist. Uh, but you, you do have to go and, and, and seek them out a little bit, knowing that that's what you want to go and do. And, and please note, as, a, as an entrepreneur, a lot of the seeking, even though that there's information that's available, whether it's online or You'll see it in print in the newspaper, but as an entrepreneur, you really have to go and seek out, you know, th those avenues for the things that's going to be, uh, you know, helpful for you, and knowing who to go to uh, and how to go about accessing them. And it's it's really going to, really, it's going to be on you to go and seek those things out. They're so there. Saying it's the brain. It's the brain that keeps you going. It's the knowledge. No, it's the. Let me let me yeah. let me help you along the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that keeps you that keeps you going. Okay. Really, it really really does. Okay. It, it it provides that that level of, mm -hmm. of comfort where you can walk in and just have an open conversation about, you know what, I'm I'm having a problem in this area, mm -hmm. and I have looked at this and I've looked at that. Tell me a little bit about your experience and what have you done in the same situation, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's what you know that's what the experience will will will, will provide to an entrepreneur or somebody who's trying to start a business, grow a business, mm -hmm. and at each phase of a business cycle, it requires a different level of experience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I may have started off with certain people initially, but you grow into mm -hmm. a different level, and it's a different level of expertise or, or mentors mm -hmm. that you would need. And at each phase of a business cycle, it requires different levels of mentors. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you. And, and Matthew, you had a question on a related note, kind of dealing with how the state incentivizes, I guess, some of these business plans. Yeah, uh, I guess I was wanting to know um, what kind of incentives does the state have to get companies involved? Because 
I went to a high school, a small school in Texas, and it had some of the best teachers in the state because it was funded by the companies around it. And I think, to me, that's the answer. You get the companies involved, and if you don't want people leaving the state, then the company should get, participate in the schools, even train those kids some of what your technology is, mm -hmm. I think you and you recruit them. The key means to improve education, to improve business climate, to improve government, and that is to get the customer directly involved in what the product is and how it's produced. That's true for K through 12 education or, or pre-K. It's true for uh, community and technical colleges. It's true for the four-year universities. Um, it's true for all of us, just as it is for private business. The customer really has got to tell you, this is the product I expect. This is what I'm willing to pay for. And I'll tell you this, if, if education is well aligned, when it is well aligned with the needs of its customers, you mm -hmm. see the customers step up and contribute mm -hmm. uh, in a big way, particularly at four-year universities. And the programs where we have centers of excellence in the state, and we do, we have we do. tremendous excellence in the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And where we have that excellence and it's lined up with its customer base in the state, you see businesses stepping up and contributing and downing chairs and getting involved in the program, sending people to those campuses to get involved. Right, I don't think it should be just funding. It should no, be, it's you not know, just programs. Just, it's so much more than funding, yeah, but is. funding is important. And the state yes. should get the companies here, and then those companies should get involved in the community, yes. Yeah. You're, you're seeing some of that happen in, uh, in high schools, uh, which, which I think is a really positive sign. Uh, in, uh, in central Louisiana, there are uh, two companies particularly that, that have now uh, gone to high schools and helped design curriculum uh, that is specific to their industry, uh, construction trades in one case, of, and uh, wood, uh, woodworks, uh, uh, wood industries in the other. Uh, they're teaching those classes at the high school level, uh, and it's, it's kind of the, the opposite of the old sponsoring uh, a school. It's actually getting in there hands-on and helping affect what's going on in the classroom. Uh, in inner city in Oklahoma City, a, a large oil company in downtown Oklahoma City uh, adopted a school and gives every employee in their building release time to go to that school every day. Uh, so they, they, they run a bus service back and forth between the company and the school, and they'll do anything. They'll, they'll sweep the halls, they'll file, they'll do anything they can to make that school functional. I think part of the problem I've heard from a, a local school is, is funding. I mean, uh, technology is always improving, always improving, and it's outdated two years later. So you need that money, that constant flow of money and corporations can do that, you know, if, especially if they're involved and if they have an interest, they're going to keep funding that money and, and the programs to keep everything updated, where some schools don't have that luxury, you know, they deal with outdated equipment or they have to scrounge for computers or um, they lose parts, you have to replace parts, so uh, I think that's the answer in my opinion. I think that's great, but I think we also need to keep the pressure on universities to keep producing new kinds of knowledge and new kinds of ways of applying knowledge because, let's face it, the real key to success is disrupting the current customer base, right? Creating new kinds of industry, mm -hmm. you know, serving, giving people exactly what they didn't think they wanted but now realize they did all along. So I think we need to have more of those kinds of partnerships, but I think we also need to keep the pressure on universities to keep creating new kinds of ideas and new kinds of knowledge. And I think those partnerships will become more uh, viable and more plentiful as, as we keep bringing businesses into the conversation because there has been a disconnect in the past between the general public and educational institutions and business and educational institutions. Because when you're looking at education, you're talking about spending money, there's the direct costs are up in front of you, but the benefits are into the future. If you can make people see what those benefits are going to be of a long-term nature and then what you're spending now is going to have positive reverberations for out for many years into the future, uh, business and public alike will support that. And so I think that if probably education and uh, the state edu as, as well and, and universities haven't done a good enough job to make people aware of that, but bring them in. And that's when people are going to do those uh, sponsoring programs and partner and say, if, I, if, I, if they're listening to me and telling, I'm telling them what we need, they're going to provide that, I'm going to keep cooperating with them. I'm going to put more money into the system, and they're going to see the positive results of that as time goes on. It's going to be a uh, self-generating thing. It's going to perpetuate itself. And, and Melissa, we're, we're talking about the future, but I think you also worry a little bit about the, the, the backup. Yeah, what is the, um, I'm cons I'm, I support um, the technology, the venture to say technology, but I'm also concerned about, I mean, what's the backup plan? Um, and I'm also concerned about um, what, what plans do you have to um, encourage, like, people in other fields to get into technology so everybody could contribute to the prosperity of the state? 
backup plan, I think, is to is to measure what the demand is at any point and a few years down the road and to be producing the workforce to meet that demand, whatever it may be. It's not all in high tech. There are tons of jobs out there, excellent jobs, which, uh, which are not considered high tech, but which certainly provide a career path that provides financial independence, the ability to support a family, to pay for kids going to school and that kind of thing. And so that, that's got to be part of the mix too. It's not all high tech, but certainly high tech is a, it, everything's becoming more technologically savvy and advanced all the time. I think somebody else mentioned earlier that teaching technology has to be ingrained in the teaching of all subjects, core subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's a big part of the answer so that people are prepared. Hi, you know, what we consider high tech is not strange or, uh, or awkward for people, but uh, it's just part of what they do, what they know, um, just as reading is. And um, I, I think that's where we need to go so people are prepared for multiple parts. Mm -hmm. that, they, that when they get to a decision point, when you leave high school, where do you go next? Um, it, when you leave, you get a bachelor's degree or a, or a two-year degree, where do you go next? Do you continue on or do you go to the workforce that you're prepared to make those decisions and that you're exposed to the right information and that you have a good background to make informed decisions? If, if you had gone to the uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education 10 or 12 years ago and said, we want you to focus on digital media, they would have laughed you out of the room. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have happened. They can't see that far into the future. Um, it, it, we know now that, that it was a good play and that we should have done that. Uh, something is out there right now that we don't know about mm -hmm. and, and that will affect us. It will disrupt us. And the only preparation for that is to think of your, your educational experience as a platform, uh, a way of, of getting a set of skills that are flexible and that can be added to. That's your backup plan. Yeah. And it's also to think individually and as a group uh, in an entrepreneurial way. Uh, how am I going to survive the next downturn? If I get laid off, what am I going to do? What, what courses can I take now? What skills can I build now that will allow me to survive anyway? No, I was also going to add that it's the applicable use of technology versus the innovative, creative development of it. You will never, at, at this point in our society, getting away from technology will, it's in everything that we do. Uh, you know, you, you pick up your, I, I had to give my cell phone <laughs> to someone, right? So he, here it is, and I, I, I would imagine if we, we took a poll just in here, how many people have a cell phone? I think 100% of us will probably end up raising, raising our hand. Um, so we may not be the creators of, but surely, Technology will impact us in everything that we do, from you know computers, the uses of a computer, the use of, of the internet, the use of our cell phone. But are we going to be the ones to innovative, create, have disruptive, innovative opportunities and in technologies? Those that's a little bit different. But technology is going to be a part of the fabric of our life from now and forever. It's not going to go away couple of points uh, just to uh, reiterate some things that already been said. Uh, technology of course can be used in many applications and in the basic very important things like the math skills, the reading skills, the English skills, we can, we can facilitate those things and make them easier to, and more uh, acceptable to students. So they're going to relate to technology, they're going to have fun learning how to do the basic things that they need to know. We can, we're not going to ever uh, neglect those basic things. You need to have communication skills, you need to have math skills, you need to have these other kind of skills. And, and what an education does for you, it's never going to keep you 100% up to date with what's going on, because things. Are so, but it makes you educable, it makes you aware of things, and it gets you in the, the mode of learning and always wanting to assess and reassess, which I think everyone has to do at every level. And, and a Gordon and Khadija, Gordon, maybe uh, we have, have just a little bit of time, maybe some short questions. Well, I want to go back to the business, uh, the private partnership with government. Um, one of the roles of government, though, is to lead. And one of the roles of government is to invest. And so I think we, have, we, we should expect our government to invest and to lead. Uh, and we're this, just this kind of information that's being gathered tonight should inform our legislators and our governor governor to invest in higher education, invest in education so that we can be leaders. Uh, I also want to say that there are good par uh, private partnerships. Jackie's company uh, is a really good example. Uh, this center that we're in right now, the Louisiana Emerging Technology Enterprise, required a substantial investment from the state government. It's owned by the state of Louisiana. 
through UL Lafayette and the city of Lafayette, but it's populated by private companies. Mm -hmm. All the people in here are all private enterprise. Mm -hmm. So that's a good model that we can use, I think. And unfortunately, the one model that I wish I could, I could develop is a model for more time. <laughs> um, I, and I thought we had more time for more questions, uh, but unfortunately, I think we've we run out of time. But we want to thank our panelists, Mr. Isink, Ms. Beauchamp, Dr. Greco, and Mr. Clinton. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, Craig, we certainly at LPB know about using technology for education, right? We do. We've been doing it for years, and so it's good to see that, uh, you know, maybe the state is catching up with us a little bit. Although I'm so impressed at the Karen Crow High School and all the students there. I was at a big conference out in San Francisco. They had a map of the United States, and they were talking about distance learning, and, and they pointed out Karen Crow as one of the best places in the country that was connecting with uh, some of the companies in Silicon Valley. So that was really exciting for all of us. Some really bright students over there. And so Absolutely. Kind of we're optimistic, but we have a long way to go, I we think. Do. We do. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We invite you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square to take this month's survey. Sign up to follow us on Twitter or tell us what technology areas you think the state should pursue. We want to hear from you like we did from Kim, who posted a comment following last month's show on crime in Louisiana. Kim writes, 100% drug testing is needed in all the schools. In time, the numbers will decline and so will adult drug problems. This will work if we are brave enough to do what it takes, pay now or pay later. Tough, tough going for Kim, right? <laughs> well, thank, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us, Kim. We appreciate it and we want to hear from you out there as well. And please join us in December as we take a look back at the more memorable moments from our program over the last year on the Best of Louisiana Public Square 2009. Again, we want to thank Kit Becknell and her students at the Academy of Information Technology and Karen Crow, and to everyone in Lafayette for their hospitality, and a special thank you to the staff of Light for all of their assistance, and to Friends of LPB board member Peyton John. We appreciate your watching, and good night to all of you. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.